best job ever. Uh, my focus at Adobe, uh, we have a lot of people who make things pretty. Uh, I'm one of those who make things ugly. Is there anybody out there like that? Yeah, I'm really good at bad design. Uh, so I focus a lot more on HTML5, a lot more of the data-centric stuff. Uh, yesterday I talked about IndexedDB. Uh, I'm doing a lot with JavaScript now, and I'm also an old ColdFusion user. Anybody here heard of a few people? All right. So uh, I'm blogging at RaymondCamden.com. Uh, this presentation should be up there sometime today or, or maybe tomorrow. Uh, I can go through a lot of code demos, so uh, I will include all the examples. You guys can download it, play with it, etc. Uh, I'm also tweeting at CF Jedi Master. That should be on screen, but I forgot it. And I am like 25 people away from 5,000. So we have 25 people here. So please, please follow me so I can go back to high school and tell all those cool kids that I'm finally one of them. <laughs> I know you guys have thought that too, right? Okay. So the entire philosophy, the, the entire impetus uh, for this presentation, um, I was primarily a server-side developer for a long, long time. Uh, I started off actually doing funny work. I remember when JavaScript first came out, and then the front end got super ugly, and I said, screw you, I'm going to the, the back end. So I did back end work for a long, long time. So I'm in the last couple of years where I've gotten back to the front end because it's it's cool. Again, it's actually really fun to work there. And I, I do a lot of blog entries, a lot of crap normally, but like here's what I do X and JavaScript, so I do Y and HTML5. And constantly, uh, I'll get these emails that will say it doesn't work. And that's the entirety of the email. Now luckily, you know, I have super giant mental powers. I can, I can read their minds and know exactly what they mean, but a lot of times uh, I need them to tell me why it's not working. And what I have found is that a lot of people have absolutely no idea why something is broken. Uh, they basically, they went in, they copied and pasted code, and it didn't work. Now, I, I will admit, I've done that a lot myself. Uh, but when you do that and you don't really know kind of what's going on, you have no context for actually being able to figure out, well, yeah, it's broken because of this variable number being there. So let's talk a bit about just bugs in general. Uh, bugs aren't really going to be the primary issue that you're running to. Uh, there have been bugs for a very, very long time. If you've ever taken a comp side 101 class, you've probably seen this picture. This is the first uh, bug that was in that was actually found in the computer, and it was a real bug. Uh, actually, I found out on Wikipedia. Apparently, engineers have used the word bug even earlier than that, which is kind of cool. So we've had bugs for a long, long time. The primary issue, uh, issue typically is actually finding the bug. So normally we are presented with a 500 lines of code, and we have to find the exact right one that's broken. All right, how many of you have OCD and are wondering if you can find him in time before I hit the next button? Oh, too late. All right, so. What's that? No, because I want you to pay attention. All right, so I want to point out just a real simple example of a, a kind of simple control. This is the jQuery UI autocomplete control. You've probably seen it before where you begin typing and it renders a nice list beneath it. So it's, it's a nice toy. It's, it's helpful. But it's one real small little widget on your application. So this is extremely trivial, right? But for this to actually work correctly on your browser, what has to actually and uh, happen correctly. But well, number one, JavaScript has to be enabled. Typically, that's not a problem in 2013, like it was you know, five years or so ago. jQuery has to load, fine. Uh, if you're using the jQuery CDN, which most of us use, uh, if you're at the airport doing testing, which I fly a lot, uh, you're not on Wi-Fi, this will constantly trip me up at first. jQuery UI has to load. So jQuery UI has this wonderful naming system where their JavaScript file is like jQuery-UI.5.9.8.underscore.invisiblecharactercode.caret.js. So I will constantly screw that up. Guess what? They also have a CSS file, same naming system. I will screw that up every single time as well. And what's sad is that I'll script the JavaScript one, 
Alex assume that it's working fine, and of course the same problem hits with me, uh, hits me with the CSS as well. This, this particular uh, control uh, works by taking an input field and enhancing it, so you have to actually find the correct uh, input field. I will constantly typo that name. It also has a few setup options, and you have to ensure that you did that correctly. If you're using anything dynamic, you have to ensure that you're pointing to the right server. You have to ensure that that server is working. You have to ensure it's returning data in the format that you're thinking right. That one bullet point is actually like four or five sub-bullet points. So just to be clear, that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different things for a little toy <coughs> widget to work correctly. So there's a lot of places where you can screw something up. To me, the issue really is finding that first bug and actually recognizing that you have it. I was kind of hoping that this would be the most shocking picture of this conference, but was anyone in the deer picture session yesterday morning? A few of you? Okay, so I lost. <laughs> uh, so take a typical web page. Uh, can you spot the bug? What's wrong with, with this page? Besides it being a few weeks old, probably. Click the, play the thing is, it. you don't know, right? Because browsers have taken kind of a what me worry aspect of uh, you know flagging bugs to you. Uh, if you were in this my session yesterday, you you already heard the story. Sorry, but I'll say it again. I lost three days working on a application. Three days of just banging my head. The issue was that, and that this was a login issue, the person would log in and then they were immediately logged off again. The problem was that cookies were being used and I was sending the 21st cookie. How many cookies can a browser have? 20. Did the browser tell me? Did the browser say, hey, Ray, this would be really, really helpful. By the way, you sent me, you know, 21 cookies and I dropped it. No. Now, to be fair, this was pre-console days. I don't think even the console said it. There was nothing, you know, up there in your face saying that something had gone wrong. I actually want this for my errors in my browser. That'd be awesome. I'd be so inclined to fix them really, really quickly. Uh, so, part of having you know, less bugs is being a lot more proactive about it. And I want to talk about some tools that can help with that. And then obviously, unit testing, which we're all doing already, right? Yeah, everyone here is doing tests, great. Uh, one of the things I like uh, is, first, I'm a big Chrome user. Uh, there's a lot of great extensions out there that can make the browser better. One of them is called JavaScript Error Notifier. Uh, it notifies you on errors. You install it and it puts a little red X directly in the browser to make it a lot more clear that something has gone wrong. So just to prove to you. So I worked very, very hard and I made some broken JavaScript because normally I never do that. And you can see it flags right away. You can go up here and click to get what the error is. So what's nice is that with this extension installed, as I browse my site on testing, I can get a quick visual cue that something has gone wrong. It's also kind of sad how often I see this on major websites like CNN. Of course, if I go there now, it probably will not have an error. Better not. What's that? Better not. That's my site. <laughs> you made CNN? Well, me, some of the other guys oh. here, we work on that site, so they're not having any errors on it. It did, but I had that screenshot, it did. But that was one time ago, I swear. I made it. Was that you? Uh, it was his fault. <laughs> says, oh. All right, cool. So, another option uh, is a service called Air Sessions. Uh, this is a commercial service. They have a 30 day trial, uh, $5 plan. Uh, we give you up to 500 errors. And what this will do is that you'll put a simple embed in your code and it will actually track your errors. Now, when I first tried this, I remember thinking, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blog this, I'm gonna demo this. I really hope that I get enough errors to make the data worthwhile. Because my, my site, you know, is, it runs pretty well. I'm a reasonably competent developer. I probably only have a couple errors and I may not get enough data to make it pretty. <laughs> Oh, Ray. Uh, I tested about a week later, had about, I think, a thousand or so errors. Uh, this is just kind of showing you some of the reports you get. I realize that's a bit small, but 
You get spark lines showing you like how an error has increased in occurrence, it's going up and down. You get a nice list of them. My favorite is the access refuse. I think errors just sound better in French. You know, it's a bit gentler. Uh, have no idea. Can anyone here read this? You can't. Oh, that's awesome. What is that? It just means that you met something that's forced or something like that. So probably access to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I'm, just saying, I'm sensing a theme here. <laughs> like the Atmos Negate. Uh, that's just one of the reports. You can also drill directly into a bug and get a browser breakdown. Look at this. This one bug was just IE. Not even surprised at all. You can even do high level graphs to, to see like over all browsers. Again, no big surprise. IE. Uh, everyone kind of you know uh, makes fun of IE, but there's really no excuse for me to have that many errors on that browser. I mean that's just sloppy, right? So again, very, very nice service here. Uh, I would show you live data about my trial right now. Yes? So I've used a service like that before that traps JavaScript errors. And all the errors I saw were like third party things, like it tries to load on Twitter or something. Yeah. Did you have that experience? Like I wonder if the service is better at filtering those out. Well, okay, that oh, oh god, wait. Alright, so his question was, he used something like this. He knows that most of his errors were from third party services. That's part A. And part B, can you filter that out? So at A, that's that's hugely important because what happened last week, Facebook broke and like the entire internet just went to crap. Right? Probably the bad parts. Uh, but all those sites using that, that third party tool went away. So B, I, I would not filter that. If those things are throwing errors, you want to know about that. You don't want to hide them. That well my my opinion, I would not want to just blindly ignore it because it's Twitter or Facebook. Well the problem I have is that even when it's working, it, for whatever reason, it throws yeah. error and Chrome. And so it was just like thousands of errors from every page load, and there, it wasn't really a problem. It's just that's how it works. Uh, I, I don't remember if they have a filter option. Certainly, you can contact them and say, hey, can we yeah. you know, drop that out? That'd be a, a, a good feature, perhaps. Thanks. So, knowing that you have a button, uh, because you've done this testing, and you're, you, you've seen the reports, and you know that things are going wrong. So how do we start to investigate it? How do we go past, you know, it, 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 it's not working? Number one thing is start learning your browser tools, okay? Doesn't really matter uh, which one you use, as long as you, you use something. Uh, as a company, you may be standardized on IE9, or forbid, but you may be. I would say anyone still use Chrome anyway, I think it has better tools. You can still use Chrome to try to diagnose an ID error. And definitely at least be a bit familiar with a few others. Uh, I was playing with AppCache, uh, the offline support for HTML5, <laughs> real pleasure to work with. No. Uh, and it wasn't working. I spent a good hour just trying to get to work in Chrome. Nothing showed up. And for whatever reason, I was like, okay, screw this. I'll try Firefox. And immediately, Firefox just had their, uh, better error reporting. I've seen that with Safari. I hate Safari. But if I get desperate, I'll launch up Safari. And I've seen one case where Safari reported something that Chrome and Fire, uh, Firebug did not. So get familiar with one primary tool, but definitely be ready to hit those other guys out when things go to heck. Uh, IE 10 also has good tools now as well. Uh, this presentation is going to focus primarily on Chrome. Uh, that is my primary browser, although Firefox is actually getting a bit closer the last couple of months. Uh, so I want to focus on these tools and primarily talk about the parts of this that have really helped me uh, debug my issues. So the dev tools, in case you don't know, uh, it used to be a wrench, now it's was like a bent or something. Uh, some UX guy got paid a million dollars to change that probably. Uh, you click that, you go to tools, and you go to developer tools. It's also some keyboard combo. Uh, I have a Mac laptop and a PC desktop. So like every morning for the first hour or so, I'm doing OSX keyboard command on, on Windows, and then at night, vice versa, on the laptop. It's screwy. All right, so that's how to open it. And just
just in case you're curious, let me do it over here. If you want, you could actually dock this on the right. I definitely would not on a laptop, but on a bigger <coughs> screen you could. And you could also detach it as well. I keep it down at the bottom just because that's what works best for me. So there is a heck of a lot in here. The things that have been very helpful to me are those five tabs, console, network, elements, sources, and resources. Uh, but to be clear, there is a heck of a lot more than what I'm showing today. Uh, if you as a client hired me to come in and talk just about Chrome DevTools, I probably plan a full day course just on this. So in the next you know, 40 minutes or so that we have, I'm only showing you a small subset. And again, primarily focus on the things that have helped me fix my own bugs. So the console, probably the number one tab I spend most of my time on. Uh, errors show up automatically there. So even without that nice little extension, uh, you will see errors like so, right there. You can also run commands here. So if you had some logic, like click a button, ring a cowbell, and a click wasn't working, if you want to run the function that rings that cowbell, you can actually go into console and type it right in there. So you can run commands there. Uh, the console also has uh, code heading, which makes it really nice. Your own custom code, if you have a function called ring cowbell, it would show up there. So it's, it's really a nice little small mini editor there. And the other big thing in here is that you can view log messages in there. Now I am a big fan of using the console API to log messages. If you've ever used an alert box, stop doing that. Especially if you've done it in a loop and cursed yourself as it brought the entire browser down. I've never done that, I swear. Uh, some people, uh, especially if you are a traditional hardcore programmer, may look at logging as being kind of cheap. I, I don't care. Uh, it's been extremely effective for me, so I log all over the place. I especially find it helpful uh, to put log messages in to kind of track the execution flow. He clicked the button, he turned the cowbell on, and the cowbell rang. That's my understanding of how the flow goes. So I'll put log messages in there, and if I see that the messages don't match what I expected, then obviously my understanding is wrong. Maybe it's not a bug, but maybe the documentation is, is probably is not properly written. Maybe my coworker told me something wrong. Now there are actually a lot of ways to use the console via JavaScript. This entire API, it's definitely based uh, on the Firebug extension that's been out for a long time now. There's like 30 different functions. I primarily only use log and dir. Uh, log works best for simple string messages. You can also use a comma to just say, you know, do x, do y, do z, whatever. Uh, you can also uh, log complex objects. And in Chrome, it'll just kind of draw that out the best that it can. By the way, pro tip here, if I pay attention, this is the most important tip today. The more you cuss, the better you debug. It's true. When I begin dropping the F bomb in there, it, it's really close to being fixed, I swear. Just remember to take those messages out. I did that one time. All right, so I have an application here. Excuse me. Yes. You said you're using the log function, right? How do you conditionally say, like, if the code is going out to other than the F box, so say, if you have a, especially if you have an F bomb in there, so, so the question was, how can I use this logging but make it uh, conditional so that in production it's not being logged? Is that fair? Right, so I would use a build process. There are a lot of node scripts out there that will clean those messages out before your code gets pushed to a production. They'll also do that along with notification. So I, I would do it that way. Does that make sense? Did that like blow your mind? You're talking about ripping the source code out of the JavaScript itself. What's that? You're talking about ripping out the source console.log from the file itself. Yeah, no, there. Not leave it there, but don't spell it out. Well, why would you leave it there if you don't want to see it in the log? I mean, if if, if your intent is in dev, show it, in production, not, there are scripts that will do that as you move your code from dev to production. They'll take it out. 
along with doing notification and stuff like that. So I think as part of your build process, you can add that stuff in there pretty easily. Right. You, you can also override the console prototype to replace the log method. Yeah, but how would you just take it out? Depends if people want to change their code. Well, that's not changing the code, though. That's the build process taking it out. You're still You're using the console without logging What's that? Compromising the integrity of the source code. Okay. Well, all right. So that's a good point. But are you going to check in minified code into source control? Or would you check in the raw JavaScript? Your production may have something that, that's not in, in uh, source control. You may combine multiple JS files to reduce your HTTP requests, right? So your source control has uh, the raw HTML, uh, the raw JavaScript, raw CSS, etc. And as part of your build process, you combine those files into one, you minify, you do things like removing console methods. That, that's just my opinion. Definitely, you can also override the console object. Uh, I, either of those would be right, but my, my idea is better. <laughs> you let me get away with that, Andy? Is the console <laughs> part of the space itself? Yeah, so it's a part of the Chrome browser. Uh, in Firefox, it's it built in. I don't have Firebug installed, and it should still work. So it's it's, it's in there. I, I definitely ran into a lot of cases where I would do a blog demo, and I forget that IE did not have it. So I constantly had people saying it's not working because I was doing console messages. So, and that I actually did what Andy suggested and put a quick uh, fake console thing up there so it would throw an error in uh, IE. I didn't think we'd fight about console log messages. That's, that's kind of fun. All right, so, uh, not fight, discuss. <laughs> So I have a very simple application here. I'm using the powers of JavaScript to do some uh, math, where I'll say 9 plus 9, 9 plus 9 equals crap. So what I'll do, it's not working. I'm going to come in here. And again, because I like to do logging, I'm going to add a few messages here just to ensure that things are flowing the way I think they are. I have a typical document.ready block, so I have some jQuery. This should not be a problem, but because I want to be really sure, jQuery loaded. I then want to make sure that my click handler is working right. So I'll say, it clicked, darn it. And finally, I have a sum that I already got back out to the DOM. So I'll just say, I'm fixing to write, well, that's world. All right. So I reload, jQuery loaded, come in here, and click. And now I have an, an inkling as to where my bug is. So I'll go back in here and say, if this is not firing, why is some button, oh, because it's sim button. I'll go in here. And by the way, another tip, because I could run code in here because jQuery is loaded, I could have done this as well and seen that it matched nothing. And said, so, you know what I bet? I met set. So multiple ways to skin the cat here. We'll do stop. We'll do nine plus nine again. And now I see I have another error. And most likely it's because JavaScript is treating it like a string. So as a final fix, I'll go in here and I'll say, you know what? Numberize this bad boy. And I darn well better see it right, or I will start up an F bomb. <laughs> and bang. So, in case you're wondering, yeah, there is a debugger built into the browser that's coming up in like 10 minutes or so. And that would have been better, I suppose. But I am extremely fast at typing. So, I can put those messages in a lot quicker. And this is what I tend to use because it works best for me. And again, I like feeling like I have a good understanding of the flow of my application. And something this small is not really that much flow. It's basically load, listen, run. But in a larger application, I feel more comforted, I suppose, seeing that I properly understand how things are flowing when I click a button. <coughs> There's also a dot dir command. This is meant for uh, dumping a complex object. 
Okay? This is also really good where if you work with some remote API that returns some ginormous object in their docs suck, I'll console.dir that remote response just to kind of see what it is. Uh, Firefox actually renders this a bit nicer. One thing I do, and again, this is just me being OCD, <clears throat> even though in Chrome I can console.log a complex object and it's fine, I will be OCD about using .log and .dir because I want to ensure that if I write .log, I'm assuming it's a simple value and I want to see a simple value. If I do .dir, I'm assuming it's a complex value and not a string. So if I have a, con a console.log and I see an object there, then bam, right away, I know I don't have the right understanding of what my data actually is. So just as a quick example of how this looks, just going to do console.dir window. And of course, window is freaking huge. Does that happen when you do log? Then if you just put an object in the console that log, it also does the same type of thing. What's, what's right? So it's saying if he had just typed window, would it do the same thing? And yes. So I did like. Oh yeah. Like okay. that. Yeah. But I wanted to show the API has been writing from JavaScript, but I didn't want to actually make a file. No, I mean console that log. You put that object in there. I thought it also. Right, but I, I, I just covered that though. Oh, so sorry. that log works, but I like using the right one so I confirm that my understanding of the data is the same as what it is. And because I'm very OCD, I'm sure no one here is that way at all, right? Okay. So if you're doing anything at all with Ajax, this is the other very painful area where things can break uh, pretty easily. Number one thing you want to do is look, look at the output. You want to look for errors. You want to look for things like redirect. You want to see if the network request even finished. As FYI, JSONP is a bit different. So we have a few examples here. So I have an application here where I have said that math is just too much for JavaScript. So I'm going to purchase a $10,000 application server to do math for me. And I have uh, my AVAX request. Actually, we'll look at this real quick. Although it's pretty vanilla jQuery. Like so. Get foo.json. And it's going to fail. Now, in this case, the console was pretty verbose. It said it's a 404 here. But also the network, which you can filter on XHR, shows it as being red as well. So 404 is pretty easy to fix. This is my fixed version that's loading foo1. So obviously this one will work correctly. Now it broke again. If I go into console, I have nothing. If I go into network, I have no error. So what went wrong? I'm gonna go back to my code and I see, so I, I asked my application server, in this case it's just a black file, but I asked it to do math. The response came back and I drew it into my DOM, right? So I should have gotten 10 back and that should have been written into my DOM. I can actually look at this, at the response, and see that the API is different than what I was told. It's actually returning a complex object as opposed to a simple string. So I can fix that by just doing res.result. Then I have one more example. Once again, it's failing. I'll go into the response. I've corrected my code for this, but it's still broken. Can someone tell me why? I have a free copy of Chrome for the first person who knows why. <laughs> Again, my, my front-end code definitely rocks as a object. It's a, it's a string. Just no, 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 the code, so the code... Right, let's see, uh, three. See? I would tease you guys, but I, I fall for this at least once every five years. 
and it takes five years before I forget it again. I'm gonna make it a little bit easier. What's that right there? Scroll bar. Okay, so oh crap. If you've ever used an application server to automatically add a footer to your pages, if you forget that some of your requests may be for Ajax resources that should be outputting JSON and nothing else, then something like this can happen. And yes, this, this, this definitely happened to me, and I definitely missed the scroll bar for not more than five hours, I swear. And certainly, so the fix for that would be depending on what your framework is. Oh, and I also mentioned JSONP. Anyone here know what JSONP is? It's like a security hack for uh, remote Ajax. Just so you know, JSONP shows up a bit differently. Uh, so I am going to call my remote server to get stuff. And it worked. Notice that it's not in the XHR network panel. If I go back to all, I can see it and the generic listing. Because JSONP works by appending a script DOM to your main DOM, it's not an XHR request type of thing. Any questions on that? By the way, also very, very useful for just diagnosing performance issues. Uh, when I first began to get back into the front end development, uh, I took a traditional Web 1.0 bug tracker. You know, essentially, here's the bug. So you click the paginate, click the sort, click the view, a, a bug issue. I had this bug tracker, it worked great. I made it sexy, fancy, Ajax Web 2.0, and everything loaded super, super quick. Uh, and until I had that client, have you guys had that client? That client. That client. You've had that client. You know that client. So at one point, my bug tracker had 900 bugs from this one client. All his fault, I swear. And my, my, my sexy Web 2.0 app crashed because I was sending 900 bugs full of XML data every time that page loaded. So you would hit the main page and wait for a good like half a minute. When it got there, you could sort and do all that fun stuff. The second you left to go to bug and come back, it was that same horrible wait. So, it's a dumb mistake, right? But it took looking at the network request, seeing the size, in this case it's extremely small, 321 bytes. But when I saw this on my app, it was like 800K or so. So, definitely that could also help you kind of recognize uh, what could be slowing you down. I love talking about bug fixing because I've made so many bugs in my life. All right, so the next aspect, uh, this panel is one that I tend to ignore a lot. Again, coming from a backend, typically uh, designers would hand me HTML, and I would just pop it in there, and I'd, I'd add my cool fusion code around it. Uh, so I didn't really pay much attention to the elements panel. But where this could be helpful is in a number of scenarios. Taking a system like Cold Fusion, PHP, whatever, you may have your HTML in multiple different files. You may have a header file, a footer file. So even though you think you know your HTML, some other person may have broken the header file and put bad HTML in there. You can also actually create HTML directly within JavaScript. And if you're doing anything wrong there, again, the elements panel can kind of draw that out and make it clear to you. I'm going to show you a quick example of this. All right, so I have to warn you guys, uh, this is going to be a Twitter search. And I try to search for something as innocent as possible. Uh, but a few times, you know, people say naughty things on the internet. So hopefully we all know this now. So as a first example, this is going to fail right away. I want to point out, uh, I just talked about JSONP as a way to get around uh, remote access Ajax calls. For a while, Chrome did not report this in the console. In the network panel, you would get a 200 result there. It'd be red, and you would click and get no details. 
I go into Firefox, I would see nothing as well. Only Safari actually logged an error. Now, obviously, Chrome finally got that fixed, but that's a great example of where I just got desperate and I finally found a browser that would actually say what was going wrong. So I switched to JSON P. All right, someone gave me an innocent search term here puppies. What could go wrong with puppies? So this is going to hit the Twitter API, and it's going to render out nice, clean results. And using all of my design skills, which I have none of, I'm going to render them in nice uh, zebra type pattern results. And oh, that's all okay. good. All right. So obviously, don't save as on puppies. That's awesome. So this is not what I intended. Certainly, I did not want to have empty gray bars there, right? So I've done something wrong. Now, in this case, JavaScript is outputting my HTML. I got the Twitter results. I created paragraphs, put the CSS on there, and drew it out. So if I go look at elements, I can begin to kind of dig in here and possibly see what went wrong. Now, I'm going to go the long way. And here's my div results. And right away, I can see something is a bit wonky here. I have a bunch of paragraphs that have stuff inside, and I have a bunch that are empty. Well, that right there is a big clue. So I'll go into here. And again, free copy of Chrome. The first person who sees the error. Yes. Slash wrong direction. I've never done that, I swear. We'll reload it, look for puppies again, and follow. Okay. So again, me being like the data guy, the JavaScript guy, not really being a layout guy, I had not really paid attention to this until I really needed to pay attention to it and it helped me solve a problem. Was there a question? What's that? Show the fast way to do that instead of sliding down the tree. Oh, fast way. Ah, uh, yes. You can also click the magnifying glass and go like so and actually get a highlight to see the DOM that you're working on. So, again, I, I actually prefer, prefer the slow way too because it, again, it helps me reaffirm in my mind the structure that I assume is there. I'm really kind of big into confirming that what I think is right is actually doing it that way. Because most of the time it's not doing it the way I think it's doing it. So, another aspect of the Chrome DevTools is the sources panel. This will actually look at all the sources on your page. It'll be a mixture of things, but it includes your JavaScript. This is also where you will have your debugger. Now, being that this is a primarily a, a Java type conference, you guys are probably all used to using a debugger. So if you kind of laugh internally, if you make fun of me on Twitter about saying that I, I use log messages, you don't have to use logging. You can definitely use a full debugger. It has all the breakpoints. There's also in Chrome the ability to do breakpoints on things that are not really correlated, but things, for example, like click events. If you want the browser to stop on every click event, you could do that. Uh, any network requests, any DOM change. You may have forgotten where the code is that's modifying your DOM. You can tell the browser, hey, when that happens, stop. So I can figure out where the heck that's actually happening. So I'll, I have a quick example of a broken app. And I'm going to come into here as sources. And once again, my, my math is broken. So I'm going to go and load my code up here. And I'm going to scroll down to the map and just start putting in some breakpoints here. Let's do one. I'm going to reload this. And right away, I get a pause and debugger because I said pause there. I can look into my elements and say, OK, that's a sum button. Do I actually have a sub button in here? Kind of make sure that is working correctly first. And you're not letting me browse that right now, so I'll just continue on. 
I could then say, you know what, let me clear the breakpoint here, and let me actually, hold on, make sure that, so I don't want to worry about that. I want to worry about this part. I'm going to look at my code right before I write it out, say right there. Rerun it, and I can see immediately it stopped there, and I see that I have a simple syntax error. That one is easy to fix. jQuery uses dot val, not dot value. Still have my breakpoint in there, in case it's still broken. Notice it stopped here. I get access to all of my variables, and one big clue, and this is the same bug we had last time, so you know it's a string issue, but notice that in the debugger, it actually drew them out as strings. So this is a, probably a much clearer way to see that that data type is not correct there. I have another application that is as weird as heck. But basically, it takes some input, it loops from that input plus 10, and just draws out what half the value is. Don't ask me how I came up with this, but it just made sense at the time. So if I put in 9, it should go up to 19 and show me the numbers half of that. So I'm going to come here and say 9 and do the math. And obviously, I did something extremely wrong. <laughs> now, this is a loop here. Now, if I put a breakpoint in that loop every single time, it's going to stop. Now, I have to continue, continue, continue. So if something had gone wrong, let's say at 19, for example, where I should have stopped or someplace else, I have a long way to wait until I hit that. But you can actually create a conditional breakpoint. Where you add a breakpoint and then simply add some logic to say when it gets this, stop then. So I'll say i greater than 19. If I run it again, we know this run this again. It should stop unless I screwed up. Let me try it one more time. I greater than 19. Now work darn you. Sweet. So at this point, it ran 10 times and then stopped at that case where I was greater than 19. I can also begin to see once again that I have the exact same error. I have a string versus a number error. Now I have one more example of this debugger, and this just recently came out. Okay, please stop. It's a very powerful debugger. <coughs> I'm trying to actually leave you. All right. So I have a kind of stupid, simple application here where every second it's doing console.log and it's taking a value and it's adding one to it. And this is working just fine. Now imagine that there is something wrong here. Uh, typically I, I go to my code, come back here, and reload. And if I had an issue around, let's say, heartbeat 30 or so, I could either modify my code to start a bit later or I'm sitting here and waiting, right? I can actually go into sources, go into the code, and say, you know what, let's uh, change the live code. In this case, I'm just doing a simple text change. Back to console, and it updated the live code while it was running. This is called hot swapping. Uh, I think it's just the most recent Chrome, but this is so dang cool. Again, even as an IE shop, if you have some JS problem, I can definitely see, you know, we're going to load Chrome up just so we can use this one particular feature. By the way, the editor I'm using, brackets, is going to be adding this feature as well. So you can do it within a nice IDE as opposed to at the bottom of Chrome. Does that seem compelling? Did you have to save that out? You used to have to save that file. So the question was, did I have to save it? <laughs> so I did Alt S or Command S. It did not save to the file system. But that Alt S, that's something else. 
Total Chrome to do the hot swap. You can do a, a save as to save it back to the file system. But if you just want to tweak it while it's running to see if that fixes it, that's an option. And then you can do the save as to really save it. <clears throat> the next panel we're going to look at is the resources panel. Uh, if you do anything with cookies, with WebSQL, with index, uh, uh, IndexedDB, anything with local and session stores, anything with the application cache, Chrome DevTools have reporting tools for all of these. You can go right in here, go into resources, and see everything. I'm a big fan of local storage, so I put a lot of stuff in there, although now it's empty. There we go. I also use IndexedDB quite a bit. I can actually browse all my data. I do a lot of WebSQL for my phone gap work. I'll do a lot of my phone gap work just on the desktop in Chrome. I can test my WebSQL directly within here. You can actually write SQL commands in this panel and see the results, which is very, very powerful. Again, cookies are here as well, and anything uh, working with app cache will be there. Uh, by the way, so uh, I, I'm a big fan of local store. It's one of those simple, practical features that is really useful, as opposed to Canvas, which I think is just ugh. Uh, I've had a lot more need to store data as opposed to draw arcs and pretty lines. Uh, I built an extension to Chrome. Uh, Chrome is very, very cool now you can add stuff with HTML, JavaScript, etc. Where I will have a flag on a website that makes use of local storage. So I just, you know, as a nerd, I just wanted to know if a site was making use of local storage. So this will flag me a number when a site makes use of this. So I use uh, the Amazon online MP3 player. I have all my legally purchased MP3s up there, uh, all 20,000. And they use local storage out the yin yang, which was really surprising. They, they cache a lot of data there. And I use that extension to kind of help uh, tell me. And I can actually look at their code and see how they are using it. Uh, on top of that, uh, I also built an extension that turns all pictures into kittens, uh, just because I like kittens a lot. And isn't CNN nicer with more kids? You guys should officially support this. <laughs> it's, what? It's like a secret keyboard combo, you know? Okay, end up kids. Any questions so far? All right, now it gets difficult. So debugging for the web, <laughs> not the most pleasant thing in the world to do. Uh, luckily, it's gotten a little bit nicer lately. Um, yeah, I spent all day finding GIFs, it's awesome. So, you actually do have a console on the mobile web. It's kind of a real pain in the butt to use it. Hey, entering URLs is kind of a pain, which is you know, a bit sad. Uh, and for some reason, uh, people insist on buying 5 billion different Android devices, which makes testing a heck of a lot difficult. Uh, because not only do each of these have different sizes, they have different capabilities, and even more important, they have different performance. You can't just say, do they support Cowbell? Because Android 4.1 may support Cowbell, but run it a bazillion times slower than iOS. This is all knowledge that you have to kind of keep in your head or use testing to kind of figure this stuff out. So I have two solutions I want to talk to you about. Uh, the first one is warning. This is a product pitch. I'll make it short and painless as possible. Uh, we have a software program called Edge Inspect. Uh, this is part of the Creative Cloud. You can go to creative.com, sign up right now. Uh, this is free. This is a triumvirate, or a three-party system. Uh, it's a small desktop app. I'm running it right now up here. It is a Chrome extension. You can see it right there. And it's also an app that you run on your mobile device. What happens is that on the desktop, you'll start the application. I've already done that. Uh, I will enable it in the extension. I'll just turn it on, which it already is. And then on my mobile device, I will run the application. And I'm just going to actually talk about it as opposed to demo it real quick. And what this will do, on my desktop browser, if I go to a website, the mobile device will automatically go there. I don't have to type in a URL. It's amazing how nice that is. And if I change the URL on the desktop, the mobile device files along. And what makes this really powerful, 
I can take any number of other devices and every single one of them follows along as well. So if you're testing on four or five Android devices and four or five iOS devices, end devices, that's, that's not unusual. It's sad, but it's not unusual. Imagine that if you could have 10 devices following your desktop as you visit URLs. You also get this Chrome DevTools I've been showing you all day. Guess what? You get that for those devices. So if it's broken on iOS 4, you can go into the Elements panel, look at the CSS, and begin to tweak it on your desktop, modifying that one iOS device that's broken. If your boss wants to know how it looks, there's one button to request screenshots from every single device. You will get screenshots, and you will also get all the metadata. This shot was for iOS 4, uh, screen DPI, blah, blah, blah. Again, this is free. Uh, the paid version gives you more than one device, but for the free version, you can definitely do one device. Is that okay for a product pitch? Did anybody mind that? Anyone here not heard of this product yet? Not heard? Not heard. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm doing double negative. Okay, so again, you can download this right now at creative.adobe.com. The other thing I'm going to talk to you about, this is also very kind of bleeding edge, uh, is your multi buggy. This is a bit similar uh, to what I just showed, but it's for one device at a time. Remote debugging is supported in both Chrome for Android and iOS, although it's iOS 6 only. What this allows you to do is from your browser, again, get a dev tools connected to your mobile device. Now, because Android comes from Google, their setup is a bit more complex. You have to sacrifice a chicken and run a command line program, etc. Uh, for iOS, it's a bit simpler, although they make you run Safari. Ooh, what did I do? Not that. Go away. Go away. All right. So I'm going to launch Safari and my iPhone simulator. And poor Safari, I only run you for this demo. We'll load up CNN. Not that I'm picking on you guys, I swear. <laughs> no, not at all. And in Safari now, in my develop menu, I can see the iPhone simulator. And if my device was hooked up, I would see raise iPhone. And we will start looking at CNN. So I can go, I can go here. And I can start looking at the, oh, really guys? Come on. Oh, you should be ashamed. Uh, <laughs> I can go in here, I can modify the DOM. Uh, I can see console.log messages. I can run functions in here. I can say alert. I always want to do this, do a close. Have, okay, not fix that, and it. See, this is why I'm doing a good job at CNN. So I would so do that my, day, my last day of work, I would so do that. <laughs> but if I wanted to, I could go in here and I could pretty much modify everything I wanted to. And I was going to dig into the DOM a bit to change CNN to Ray, but I won't do that. Go back to the first one and click on the, the very, very, very top. Um, very, very top. That one. Why can't I modify the DOM? Because we don't want you to. Oh, no, I will want to find Tom. Um, and then on the right hand side, there's there's the brackets. Ah, there. ah thank you. So yeah, again, so if I had some wonky layout issue, I could modify it like margin, padding, whatever, until it, it looked correct, and then take that back to my code and make it better. Now go away, Safari. You bore me. File in Safari as a use. Any questions on that? All right, I'm going to talk a bit about unit testing. Uh, this is a horrible way to summarize unit testing in one line, but essentially, unit testing is a very nice way to handle those cases where have you ever fixed something and then broken three other things at the same time? Am I the only person who's, who's done that? Uh, unit testing creates a way by which we can make nice atomic small tests. I push a button, the cowbell rings. That way, when I work on something else, when I pull the lever, candy comes out, I can run my test to ensure that I've not broken the cowbell functionality. 
The focus typically is on very, very small atomic testing. One particular aspect of your application, one particular feature. Uh, the example I like to give is there's a library called Moment.js, which is a very, very nice JavaScript date library. It'll do things like, for example, give it two dates to tell you that it's two hours apart. It has a humanized function. It's very, very nice. Uh, they have like four or five core functions. They have around, I think, 3,000 or so tests. So they have gone to the extreme to make sure that any time they add any new feature, they're not breaking anything else they've ever done. Now there's more frameworks out there than what I'm talking about today. Uh, I'm going to focus on Jasmine and Selenium. So Jasmine is really more for your backend in JavaScript. It's behavior-driven type test. It's a very English-looking type language where you'll have code that actually says, when I push a button, it should ring the cowbell. I'll show an example of this. So I wrote a function a while ago that its sole purpose was given any number, I wanted to get a result back that was always four characters or less. So 10 should return 10. Uh, 532,438,000, I just want to see 532 M. So basically I want a very short format number, let's say for Twitter tweets. Uh, that'll take any possible value and make it just a bit shorter. So I wrote some code here that does it. So I have a uh, one, two, three, four, five, I have like five different cases in there. And so I can actually, using Jasmine, write tests against those. Again, this is very, very English. You can see the first one, it takes a number less than 10,000 and returns it as is. Where I can basically pass in a bunch of inputs use assertions to say, I expect this value back. And all I did was essentially add another test and another, each of these testing different aspects. And you guys can read this and know exactly what those tests are doing. So someone who is not as technical or maybe even just learning JavaScript can get a kind of a basic idea of what this testing is actually doing. <coughs> if I added some new feature to this framework, I can go to the bottom and then just add one more test in there and make sure it works. Jasmine also comes with a nice format to allow you to run it in HTML and gives you nice, pretty green results that make you happy. I mean happy. So I would love to say that I'm, I'm brilliant and I planned all this, but I did not. So when I was reading this presentation, I saw a bug in my logic. If the number is four characters or less, it should be fine as is, right? I forgot a less than or equal sign. So again, I, I would love to say I planned this so I could you know, demo it, but I did not. So I went into my testing suite and I added a new test. I did that first because I knew, I knew that I was doing that incorrect. I found a bug, I wrote my test, because maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm looking at that, and maybe it's working correctly, and I'm just stupid, okay? By putting my test there first, I can ensure that it really is broken, I really do kind of know what's going on. I'll run that test suite, and it definitely is wrong. It came back as 10K when it should have been 999. I can go into my code, and fix that, and I fix that one bug, and I didn't break anything else. And I can say that for certain because I have those six other or so tests that are running and still passing exactly. So, question? So that's Jasmine. Works very, very good for JavaScript libraries, JavaScript functions, etc. The other one I'm going to talk about, and by the way, there's a lot more than what I'm doing, it's a little five minute demos, uh, is Selenium. This is also something that's a lot bigger than what I'll be covering today, but it's more of a front-end testing system. So, whereas Jasmine was testing that function to make sure it gives an input A, it gets the right output out, Selenium actually allows me to test the front-end. So, if I want to say, when I click a button, I want to see the DOM change in Selenium, I can actually 
create a recording of me clicking in the browser and write test against that. So I can actually combine both of these guys together, make sure my backend code or my, my more atomic uh, data code works fine, and then my UI is working correctly as well. So this I'm going to run in Firefox, and all I have is, again, a simple map. It's working correctly, but I want to make sure that when I put numbers in, that it actually draws to the screen correctly. So I'm going to load their little IDE. I'm going to open up my test case, which I call test suite. And what I have done here is earlier, I simply clicked around and added some assertions. So in this case, I am asserting that the DOM item call result will have 10. So not only am I saying, you know, find 10 on the page, I'm actually specifying exactly what part of the DOM is going to have that value. I go in here and then run this. Oh, it ran so fast. Slow it down. And now it's driving Firefox like a real person would. And going through my test test. I have both a good test and a bad test. Again, I would love to say that I planned this. When I was making the presentation, I wrote the logic in for error handling, and I did actually show what I did. So you guys can laugh at me. I wrote this very, very quickly. I tested it by hand, but my initial code had that. So when I tested, I put a bad number in the first value, and because of short circuit bullet evaluation, it worked fine. I then did, did my testing. I wrote a test case to make sure it really worked. In my test case, I was a bit more formal. I put values in both of those, and my test failed. So I actually found a bug in my program by writing the test to prove that it was working correctly when it really wasn't working correctly. So you know, I, I hate to think that we still have to prove to our managers that testing makes sense. Uh, hopefully, management has gotten past that. Uh, Probably in the real world, that's not the case just yet. Uh, but it really just kind of drives a point home that these things not only can help you find and prove future bugs, but help find bugs uh, straight away as well. So, just to give you some more stuff to go from here on, uh, I talked a bit about extensions. You've seen three of them. Uh, you saw the error notifier. You saw the little uh, local storage notifier. You saw the kitten one. Uh, if you're having some issue with X, let's say the canvas tag, for example, check for browser extensions that may make that a bit easier to use. Uh, I have played a bit around with the HTML5 Chrome APIs for file system access. And there's an extension out there that makes debugging that a heck of a lot easier. So take a look for that. Definitely Firefox has its own market. Even Safari has extensions as well. And I cannot stress enough, uh, being a Chrome-only person, I ignored Firefox for, for quite some time. They have a documentation site called the Mozilla Developer Network. And I assumed that it was Firefox only. That's not the case at all. Their uh, dev network has great docs and great articles on technologies, that, on technologies that cover all of the browsers. If you've ever gone to Google and ended up on W3 Schools, and you're a fan of W3 Schools, and Google, just type MDN space, like MDN JavaScript array, and you will get immediately to the MozDev uh, Moz network JavaScript array reference. and never accept someone saying it's just broken. Unless they're a paying client. All right, so, any questions? Is that a halfway raised hand? Yes, uh, the Safari and iPhone simulator, uh, you can do that part actually software that built it. Uh, it's like Are you asking if the Safari remote debugging is extra software? As far as I know, it's built into Safari and iOS 6. You have to enable it in uh, your settings in the browser uh, on your device. And, and Safari just works when it recognizes. And definitely works with a real phone as well. I just didn't want to pull up my USB cable.
But also, if you're doing anything with phone gap, it works there as well. Yes? So, what's the best tool for dealing with IE8? What's the best tool for dealing with IE8? It's called Recycle Bin. <laughs> uh, so, um, I would try to work it in Chrome. Try to recreate it in Chrome because you can use the stuff debugger there and you know logging as well and as best as possible. Uh, I've heard that Visual Studio is very, very well done and has hooked it to the browser. Now whether it supports IE8, I'd be shocked, but you may want to look to see what Microsoft has in terms of, uh, of, of their software. I've heard nothing but good things about their IDEs. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with it. One suggestion I make about IE8 is uh, Firelog does have a JavaScript extension. Um, it's not the best tool and it, it doesn't work all the time because IE8's JavaScript engine is, is kind of lacking, but it, it definitely is better than the IE8 built in tools for debugging some other things. It gives you some functionality out of it. It's called the uh, Firebug Lite, right? Yeah. I'll also add so if you're doing anything with Ajax, you can use a third party tool like uh, Charles or Service Capture. Uh, to, to check those Ajax responses. That would basically mimic the network panel in Chrome. Yes? Did you talk a little bit about the brackets editor? I would love to talk to you about the bracket editor. So, this is an FYI. Uh, brackets is an open source coding editor that Adobe launched about a year or so ago. But the idea of can we build an editor with HTML and JavaScript? So they began working on this project, and they've had a lot of success. It's actually working very well now. This is our editor is being run with jQuery, HTML, and CSS. Uh, it's focused on doing web development. It's not meant to be an IDE like Eclipse, which I think is a good thing, so I'm not a big fan of Eclipse at all. Uh, so it doesn't have things like source control built in. It has HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Uh, it's also meant to kind of uh, help make your life a bit easier. So tell me if this sounds familiar. Web page broken. Alt tab to the editor. Type. Alt S. Alt tab. Alt R. Crap. Alt tab. Type. Alt S. Alt tab. Alt R. Crap. A lot back and forth, right? Uh, you can actually connect brackets to your browser. So as you type in the editor, it updates the code automatically. Uh, for CSS, you get live updating. So while you tweak CSS, you can see things reflow and correct, uh, which I think is better than Chrome DevTools because you have it in the editor right there and you can save directly. Uh, JavaScript uh, is coming soon in terms of being able to hop swap from the editor. HTML works as well, but it waits to you actually save the file before you do it. So it has a very intimate connection to Chrome, uh, which makes debugging, I think, a lot nicer because you're, you're using a full IDE. Uh, not an ID, full editor. Um, it also has an extension API, so if you really do want something like source control, then you can add it in yourself. Uh, I added support in, I mean, because I'm saying this, it's going to break probably, uh, but I like MDN so much that I added MDN lookup directly to the browser. So this actually hits MDN to get the docs for the script tag within my editor. Yeah, it's open source, totally free. You can fork it and add cowbell support all you want. There's also uh, Edge Code, and Edge Code basically is our safer version of Brackets. So Brackets works great. It's still a little bit rough, and you know, still not 1.0 yet. Whereas Edge Code is our this probably will not melt your CPU version. Does that answer your questions? Anybody else? If not, uh, again, you guys can contact me at RaymondCamden.com. Thank you all very much.